So the panel that we're gonna now begin is called The Pain We Carry, How Race, Gender, Class, and Globalization Intersect on Eco-Anxiety and Climate Distress. And our moderator is the fantastic Farhana Sultana. If you care about global politics, decolonization, political ecology in general, you know Dr. Farhana or you've been influenced by her work. She is a professor in the Department of Geography and the and Environment at Syracuse. She is an interdisciplinary scholar. She's worked on political ecology, water governance, climate justice, post-colonial development, social and environmental justice, um, feminisms, transnational feminisms. Her work on decolonization is seminal and her research and scholar activism is drawn from her lived experience. Um, so here is someone who really embodies inner community and planetary resilience. Farhana, thank you so much and welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dekila, for that really marvelous and generous um, introduction. And uh, thank you everyone else who's joined us today. Uh, welcome from wherever you may be located. I want to really reach out and say thank you to all the folks behind the scenes um, in Madison and elsewhere who've organized, you know, these RIDA um, conference, or rather the summit and the sessions that have been going on since yesterday. So as Dekila mentioned, I'm a uh, professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Syracuse University, and I've worked extensively on issues around um, various topics that are, that are interlinked with climate justice. And in particular, relevant to this session, I'm really interested in drawing from uh, the work that exists across the world, but that is often invisibilized due to histories of colonialism and imperialism, but also globalization and everything that comes with it in, in terms of suppression of knowledge and sharing of ideas and valuing different perspectives. So I want to give a shout out to everyone who is trying to upend those kinds of processes of both erasure and silencing, but then also a form of invisibilizing in what we think we know and, and what gets attention. So in my own work, I look at those intertwined issues around economic, uh, cultural, political, and ecological issues that play into structural, systemic, inter insti institutional, and intersectional differences, and particularly in the Global South. And I'm delighted to be moderating this session. And we have three wonderful panelists here with us today. And I hope we'll all take away a lot from what they have to say and our collective deliberations here thereafter. So each person will speak for about 15 minutes and uh, then we'll open it up for Q&A. And I'm happy to deal with questions that come in via chat or the Q&A box. And then we'll try to combine some questions so we can keep to time. So first I'd like to introduce um, Kyle. Kyle Hill, if you want to turn on your camera. So Kyle is an assistant professor at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences and the Department of Indigenous Health. He is Ojibwe, Dakota and Lakota and focuses on community-based participatory research with American, Indian and First Nation communities in both the US and Canada. His research um, areas uh, include the social, political, and ecological determinants of health, climate justice, and decolonizing health and wellness in indigenous communities. Um, welcome, Kyle. Um, so next we'll have Kaylee Ober. Um, hi, Kaylee, you're already on camera, thank you. Uh, Kaylee is an expert um, on climate and migration issues. She currently leads research and analysis on climate change, migration and displacement, and transboundary water and conflict issues at the United States Institute of Peace. She has worked on these issues for over 15 years with organizations like Refugee International, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Climate Change's Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. And last but not least, we have Tamara. So Tamara, if you want to turn on your camera, thank you. So Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin is the CEO and president of the Environmental Grant Makers Association, or EGA and has held several leadership positions, including as a North America Director of Programming at 350.org and 350 Action in the past. She recently founded Climate Critical Earth, a visionary new organization supporting the new generation of anti-racist climate leaders. In her work, Tamara has always focused on equity, access, and community, 
and increasing opportunities for vulnerable populations. So I hope you will all uh, give a round uh, applause, a silent applause, to our um, fabulous three panelists. And I'll turn it over to each one and they'll speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so for, first up, Kyle, over to you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and if someone could give me a thumbs up just so you can see it. Um, all right, great. <clears throat> uh, so, Buju and Dinaway Magana Doug. My name is Kyle Hill. I am from uh, enrolled in the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe, um, and I'm a lineal descendant to the Sistan Wapton Oyate and um, Shine River Sioux tribes, uh, both in South Dakota. Um, and so just bringing in Anishinaabe, Lakota, and Dakota uh, values, uh, beliefs, and a lens to this work. And so today I wanted to start with uh, just exploring a, um, a piece that I authored uh, not too long ago in a climate justice journal uh, regarding the impacts on mental health, particularly for our Indigenous communities. Um, and also just kind of as we move forward, explore questions related to this and, and other issues. And so the talk today is just a tenets of climate justice and indigenous lens. Um, this is a bit about my, uh, my family, my, uh, my dad, we're at ceremony, my partner and stuff like that. And this is our little one who really helps ground a lot of my work these days and, and thinking about the seven generations um, approach in looking at what's the world that we're leaving for them, our little ones here. Um, and so um, I'm coming to you today from my Dakota homelands that we were exiled from. Uh, so very happy and blessed to be back home or in my home of um, uh, St. Paul or Amnesia Skao Tue, as it's known. This is a, a map from Marlena Miles, a very gifted uh, Dakota artist. And so um, there's a lot here, I think, as it's uh, represented by the work that we're doing uh, within this panel, certainly in this uh, summit. And so some of the tenants I wanted to visit today in relation to climate justice and the uh, impacts and the intersection on Indigenous health are one, you know, as we look at the Anthropocene or the human induced cause of climate change, um, from an indigenous perspective, we see this as very much uh, colonialism and, and having um, Dr. Um, Sultana on to moderate this, looking at climate coloniality or climate colonialism is very important for us as indigenous people. And uh, relatedly, um, as we've seen in uh, many of the materials, products and documents that are coming out uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and especially the, a, a more recent uh, White House document elevating indigenous traditional ecological knowledges uh, that offer uh, decolonizing alternatives to Western Eurocentric adapt climate adaptation, uh, but we also talk about two wide seeing approaches, which merge both, you know, Western uh, scientific approaches to adaptation and indigenous approaches. And then finally, um, just thinking and talking about how honoring tribal sovereignty um, uh, recognizes indigenous rights is important for reparative frameworks for indigenous peoples. And this, I think, is, is very much represented within the land back movement as we understand it, as we know it. Um, and so the first slide here going in is just thinking about how colonialism caused climate change. And usually when I give this talk, I talk about colonialism as a process along three different kind of um, uh, processes or, or um, eras. And for us as indigenous people to North America, the first process was, was dispossession. And this is what I, I think of as, as the genocide of our peoples. And so trigger warning for, for those of you, but um, I think when I consider how climate change, the, 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 um, the impetus of it, I, I think about how we treated our indigenous people to these lands. And so for many of those, uh, many of you who are attending that don't, 
know this, American Indian land really um, um, was stolen effectively. And so when we look back at this, this map uh, from 1776 forward, you see that there was a westward expansion. We think about that and we understand that as like the doctrine of discovery, which is expansion at the expense of occupancy. And so what's important here, um, of course, is just seeing the scope of this, but also recognizing that our uh, indigenous people to this land, my communities, as well as those of countless others, um, there are about 574 federally recognized tribes, which are the little red, you know, spots at the end of this, but um, we all held, um, uh, we all care to, care took for our lands, um, and that relationship to our lands was vital to our existence and so and our spiritualities right and so when i think about that i have to consider like even more recently the um this study that came out in 2021 um and so a lot of certainly my elders and knowledge keepers recognize that you know the, the the land theft of indigenous people, colonialism was near complete. Um, people would say 95 to 99%, but here with, there's very, um, I wanna say uh, uh, many, many kind of methodologies that, that went into this manuscript or this, this study, but um, suffice it to say that, that this is a very well done. And so, what they realized or what they came to the conclusion was that 98.9% of lands were, um, were taken, where we were dispossessed of in indigenous communities. Um, and people uh, at the very, the, the average forced migration was two, uh, nearly 230, 240 kilometers. Um, and the furthest was 2,774 kilometers. Now, what that means for, for us as a peoples was that these indigenous traditional knowledges or locally based knowledges that we use, our belief systems essentially in life ways, um, was uh, faced a major disruption, right? We had to learn how to live with the land and, and that relationship um, in, a different, in a wholly different matter, manner. And then below that, you'll see that the historical homelands um, had more days of precipitation than they do now, um, had less days of extreme heat than they do now, and mineral val value potential where it was higher uh, than present day lands, which, which essentially is um, how it sounds. Mineral deposits could be oil and stuff like that. Um, and so that leads us to just this, this next tenet that really we lived interdependently with the land and we still do to a large extent, but certainly there's an, uh, a great degree of um, rec reclamation, of relearning that's happening. And that's not without uh, a re-traumatizing because we have to go through that process um, in order to recognize that we do have teachings still we do have our languages that govern these ways, and we do still have our traditional activities and spiritualities that are really, um, when, when I hear indigenous traditional ecological knowledge is what comes up for me as an indigenous person to these lands is our, our traditional culture, traditional activities, our cultural activities and our spirituality. Um, and so, um, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Nicole Redverse, uh, uh, did this great study on looking at the determinants of planetary health. And one of the determinants, uh, one of the main determinants was our interconnectedness with the land. Um, and so indigenous traditional ecological knowledges as kind of a conduit of that relationship has been transmitted through time immemorial, generationally, intergenerationally, uh, via oral storytelling and practice. Um, and so these iTechs, as we know them, or uh, our traditional knowledge systems, share direct associations with our land and sacred sites. And so very much um, indigenous people are place-based, land-based, and that's how our belief systems function. 
Um, now for us as Ocheti Shakoi or Lakota and Dakota communities, that's the, the Black Hills. That's where we belong. That's who we are. Um, for us as Anishinaabe people, it's uh, the place where food grows on water. Um, and certainly that's Monoman or, or wild rice. And so these are very like important cultural indices of how we know we're home and how we know who we are. And a lot of communities are facing a lot of uh, not only disruptions to their due to environmental change or climate change, but disruptions to their identities because of the erosion of some of their ecosystems at this time. And so one of the teachings uh, as we move into this work and throughout in our families and in our communities is that um, we are not separate from the land. And a lot of our languages tell us this story and help us think in this manner that the land is us and we are the land. So therefore, um, the land cannot be healthy until indigenous people are healthy and vice versa. Indigenous people cannot be healthy until the land is healthy. And so this kind of leads us to our, um, one of our tenets again was that um, this idea that we need to reconcile and, and realize in very tangible ways how colonialism has impacted uh, not only our communities, but has facilitated, you know, um, anthropogenic climate change. And so moving forward, when I think about climate justice and resilience, um, and this is um, from an article that came out, I believe it was like uh, 2020. Um, but number one is articulating indigenous conceptualizations on and approaches to health so that we can realize that indigenous, uh, the health of indigenous people at the same time as looking at the health of the land due to some of these cultural and spiritual activities that are land-based. Uh, next is interdisciplinary collaborative approaches. And so looking at um, how indigenous knowledge systems um, alongside Western scientific approaches and like two-eyed seeing approach um, can work together to resolve some of these, um, some of these climactic, uh, some of these adaptive capacity of our communities. And then to leverage and build on sociocultural strengths um, strategies, again here, like a re reparative frameworks to affect change on root causes of vulnerabilities, which is the social and the ecological determinants of health um, and the impacts of colonialism, right? Um, and then again, enhancing climate related health risk management, and then in strategies, policies, programming that return land to indigenous peoples. So the testament, I think, to our abilities to not only recognize indigenous knowledge systems as important um, and improving our adaptive capacity in our communities. Um, I think the other side of that for indigenous communities is what kind of uh, rep reparative frameworks can we, um, can we develop in that reconciliation process? Um, and then indigenous to uh, inter intermediate determinants of health. Um, for us, it's about kinship networks, kinship to land, kinship to non-human beings, kinship to the spirits that we see in the land, you know, our, our air, our celestial systems and stuff like that. Um, of course, this includes relationships to land, our languages, our ceremonies and spiritual connectedness, uh, cultural connectedness. and. Uh, more recently, we did a study, um, our, we did some analyses on a longitudinal data set looking at what we termed uh, indigenous eco-relational engagement. And this had, um, which is essentially land-based activities, cultural, spiritual, and um, some, some um, um, indicators on language facility. And what we found was that those shared a positive association with uh, positive mental health or flourishing. And so the idea of cultural connectedness and land-based um, um, traditional spiritual activities and language are very important for our health. And this includes hunting, fishing, and gathering, um, storytelling, and knowledge sharing. 
And that's my daughter. We were picking blueberries that day. So I just love this picture. I think it's really um, tells the story that we're trying to uh, really embody here. And then um, finally, I think the biggest thing here as we return to this third and third tenet and honoring the sovereignty and self-determination of tribes is we really want need to honor treaties. We need to honor the uh, the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we need to um, recognize that I believe it's Article 25 that says we have a right to um, our spiritual connection, uh, our languages, and uh, our connection to the lands and our territorial homelands. Um, and so with that, I just want to say miigwech. Um, and for anybody that wants to contact me, I'm transitioning to the University of Minnesota um, at the School of Public Health and the Division of Environmental Health Sciences in a couple of weeks. And so that'll, that's going to be my email moving forward. Uh, but miigwech, I really appreciate everyone's time. And um, thank you uh, for the kind introduction, Dr. Sultana. And um, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Kyle, yep. for uh, keeping to time perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that helps all of us to keep moving forward and to ensure that we have a lot of time for generative and productive conversations at the end. So I'm going to now hand it over to Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee, are you here still? Yes, you are. All right, I shall hand it over to you. Take it away. I'm indeed here. Thank you so much, Farhana. So uh, my name is Kaylee, and I should say at the very outset that I'm presenting on behalf of myself as an independent scholar and researcher on this subject and not as a representative of USIP in any way. Um, and as Farhana mentioned earlier in my intro, my specialty is climate change and migration issues. So I thought it would be useful maybe to give a little bit of uh, background, um, a 101 on that, and then sort of really dive into this understanding of intersectionality and even sort of positionality within this field. So I'm gonna go ahead and also share my screen. Um, let's do this. Great. So I think something that Kyle has already touched upon um, and that I'd like to underscore is that climate change is not some future event. I think we all know this, right? Climate change is already affecting us in different ways. And in fact, it's already affecting displacement outcomes in the world. Um, here's a stat from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center from their latest global uh, report on internal displacement. In 2022, 32.6 million people were displaced by disaster, which is 41% higher than the average annual displacement uh, due to disaster over the last 10 years. Um, a vast majority of this displacement, 31.8 million people, are displaced by weather-related disasters. Um, I'm just highlighting that because weather-related disasters are much more linked to different sorts of um, climate change processes, uh, which we know are exacerbating sort of the intensity um, and the frequency of these sorts of disasters like floods, um, drought, hurricanes. And we see that real time in our everyday life. Um, moving forward, though, um, I was I participated in a, a report that the World Bank put together, um, projecting how many people might be affected by climate change that might have to move internally within their own countries. Uh, it finds that in its most pessimistic scenarios and projections, that means that without deep cuts in carbon emissions, um, and without a more sustainable and equitable future, that um, more than 200 million people might be on the move in the face of climate change internally. Um, this doesn't mean this is a baked, uh, a, a fully baked, locked in future. It just means that we need to be aware that we have the ability now to change that future to ensure that not so many people are affected by climate change, that they have to be um, making this a difficult choice to migrate, uh, maybe perhaps having no choice but to migrate. Um, you know, these numbers are interesting, uh, a good point of reflection. I don't think they're indicative of the whole story. And so I present to you sort of a slide that uh, requests a bit of caution on using the numbers, because I think the numbers really obscure sort of the humanity behind the impacts of, of climate change. Um, and in fact, often can reproduce um, sort of bad narratives or um, very detrimental narratives. So here is a slide that shows if you Google climate refugees, uh, what pops up. So it's largely people of color from the majority world in very dire situations. Um, while it is true that climate change may impact those parts of the world in more extreme ways, 
um, I think it oversimplifies sort of the ways in which uh, people in the majority world uh, respond to and adapt to climate uh, impacts. And I think it also um, lends itself to detrimental narratives, such as uh, people from the majority world uh, partaking in mass migration to the borders of the US or the EU because of extreme climate impacts. Um, and that just lends itself to sort of um, more policies that doubles down on border security and border infrastructure. And that's something I think that, uh, you know, we can all agree that that's, that's not what we're aiming for in a world of, of justice. Um, it also obscures sort of the real complex and nuanced realities of the ways in which climate change interacts with displacement outcomes. So case in point here is the Syrian civil war often touted as one of the first um, cases of climate-related conflict or climate-related displacement. Um, but uh, again, a bit of caution here. So while there was an extreme drought from 2007 to 2010, unprecedented extreme drought uh, in Syria that, that led to uh, failing crops um, and a lot of hardship, uh, there had been decades of bad governance and some, uh, uh, some very negative forms of governance. In fact, from the 70s to the 2000s, for instance, there was this government push for an increase in agricultural production, uh, increase in irrigation, uh, but also meant that there was an overuse of groundwater already coming to a head at that time. Um, then in the 90s, we see a big push for privatization and um, which intersects with crony capitalism in Syria, um, which led to increasing poverty, increasing inequality, increasing unemployment. And then in 2008, right when that drought was hitting is when the government took away uh, fertilizer subsidies for farmers. So um, those are people already on the edge, perhaps, of facing extreme poverty. Um, and the drought was just sort of the, the last tipping point. So it's something to keep in mind when we're talking about sort of what climate related displacement means. Um, and then I wanted to reflect on a, a couple of questions. Um, and First is sort of, you know, can we distinguish climate related migrants from other kinds of migrants? Um, in some cases, it's very difficult to do so. Um, it's important in some respects because it does imply different forms of justice or remuneration that is needed, right? So there's different countries that are responsible for the vast um, amount of carbon emissions. And so should they be responsible for um, those impacts and in what ways, who pays and to whom? Um, but on the other hand, it also sort of limits our ability to sort of think about the futures uh, of climate related migration or what needs to take place. So often when I was working in the policy space on this, the discussion is about refugee status or um, ability to access asylum. Those things are important, but it is a very limited space, a very limited uh, policy uh, conceptualization of how to address this issue. Um, and of course, it's very fraught with current political realities, right? So there's, there are already barriers to receiving refugee status. Um, in fact, only 1% of those who apply to be um, refugees receive that status. Um, so in some ways, th can this limit justice? And I think, I think it can, um, because we, we get stuck on these sort of patterns of thought. Um, and it's not necessarily addressing sort of the most vulnerable or extending the most amount of support or protection to those who need it. Um, and ultimately giving them the agency or the choice to make, um, to, to move or not. And so that brings me to sort of my reflection personally, which I think all of us here um, on this call can do, which is, so what does that mean for us personally? I think it's, for me, it's about being self-reflective about positionality and understanding uh, sort of my own background um, and overlaying that with the, the the complexities of, of climate related migration. So I'm uh, the result of various uh, migrations to the United States from various parts of the world. And my ancestors came to the US for a variety of reasons, right? So oppression, obviously poverty, but also love opportunity. So I think bringing in sort of this nuanced um, way of thinking about why people migrate or if they should and have the ability to migrate, uh, centering sort of this discussion of agency is, is truly important uh, in the discussion on climate related migration. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Farhana. Thank you so much, Kaylee, um, for keeping it very short and sweet, but incredibly powerful. So I want to now turn it over to uh, Tamara 
to round us out, then we'll open it up for Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is incredible to be able to um, connect with the audience in this way to think through our shared journey and how we've landed uh, in a similar place uh, using entirely different um, methodologies because the work itself has become so very, um, so very challenging and all encompassing. It feels like uh, two decades, 26 years into this work, more or less, it has deeply felt like the work was disconnected in a way that only served uh, folks who were not interested in supporting community or people or thinking through the ways that we work. Uh, I'm going to try to move. Uh, let me please let me know if you can see. Uh, can you see a screen that has climate critical earth on it? Okay, thank you, because uh, this isn't my jam. <laughs> So um, I wanna say a little bit about myself. So my name is Tamara Tolls O'Laughlin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, if you are vision or low um, vision impaired, I am an African-American woman um, with a dark complexion and short spiky brown hair, which appears to be black uh, every so often because that's just how light is. Um, I am excited to be in this conversation and have a track record of working on uh, systems and not symptoms. So I wanted to share a little bit about who this information is coming from. So you'll know uh, more than my bio that these are the places where I practice um, systemic work, the places where you might be able to find me, uh, if, especially if you wanna have a critical conversation about the work that we're doing and my work at uh, EGA, which is just one uh, functionality of a long work, a uh, long arc to try to move the conversation. So uh, whereas my co-panelists have really brought in the global meta and macro scale, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the unfortunate coldness and warlike tendencies of what we do to each other in this work and how it is perpetuating all of the themes that were raised by um, my co-panelists. So at Climate Critical Earth, we are very deeply focused on the idea that our systems are in fact buckling under a number of, uh, some folks call it the poly crises, folks who are coming to this work from an HIV AIDS lens, we happily call it the pandemic because our work is in such a fragile space uh, that we are very certain that uh, any number of the things that we're facing could cause catastrophic harm to our communities. And so we're so, um, vulnerable that it feels a lot like HIV AIDS work and that we uh, can't necessarily determine what it is that will cause the harm. But as um, a collective of folks who have been uh, combined lifetimes thinking about this, we are watching somewhat 20, somewhat 30, somewhat 40, somewhat five years and somewhat five minutes of experience, our own habits create new grounds for fights that we're already having, recognizing that the only thing that's changed is that the climate clock is not on our side. So as was mentioned by my co-panelists, there are regimes of authoritarianism and eco-fascism that show up at the national, regional, local, global context simultaneously. Um, we are recognizing that regressive and standardized um, racism, any ism that you could put as a lens over this work is currently being trotted back out at a time when the climate crisis is really uh, amplifying and accelerating the harm to folks who have been erased and have been made invisible and who've had their uh, lives, livelihoods um, stolen from them. And so whether that's happening in the United States domestically or happening at the, in the global governance stage between entities within uh, Turtle Island, uh, recognizing that simultaneously we're also going through overlapping personal, interpersonal, lateral and systemic violence, which makes it really difficult to be someone who does this work for a living because the planet could care less whether you get along with your colleagues or you can agree to disagree or whether you're fighting over a comma in a global conversation. So our mission is to focus on averting climate disaster by investing in the people who invisibly do the work that makes this all possible. This kind of analysis, this kind of focus, recognizing that uh, for all of the incredible interventions that are happening simultaneously, the people who are every day practicing with their lives as organizers and activists are in real need of a practice of rest, 
of restoration and of community care that takes away the systemic and interpersonal shame that we have as a movement around taking rest and being human. So recognizing that it would be easier to uh, have this modality in play 50 plus years of environmental work in the nonprofit uh, design in the US context means that it's time to raise all of that work and develop new modalities of leadership so that the folks who are here can do this work. For us, for all the reasons that were mentioned, uh, it had, the work has to be anti-racist. It has to be strategic and focus on the life cycle of individuals who are in this work because it's pretty difficult to imagine that we can build a whole planet of solutions if everybody doing it is broken, is harmed, is unable to take the appropriate pauses when life in its complexity makes it challenging because the basic mission of climate and environmental work, of justice work of any kind, is that you're doing something that is actually the whole world's responsibility. And so even if you succeed, the people who are warring against you will get another chance to keep fighting you. So given the uniqueness of that situation, we have developed a cycle of practices where we really do take rest with other folks in this work so that we can see each other do, uh, doing things other than just being very busy and just calling for the right thing. Uh, here are a few of the folks who helped inform that work across the globe um, and where the specialties of healing and uh, thinking about mass mobilization and connecting across continents and writing the future with their own hands. We're all thinking through this from our own lens, knowing that it's a tapestry of work. So in 2022, we did a movement survey, the first of its kind that actually spoke to the practitioners and organizers and activists about a subject that is pretty shameful, uh, which is to say that people are feeling um, the harm, the burnout, uh, personally responsible for not being able to show up and how their bodies respond to taking on such a massive mandate. So as an act of love, we did a survey that looked at 108 groups, 108 distinct groups across um, the work, whether they are in green teams or organizations or volunteers or big entities or funders to ask uh, um, some basic questions to find out who's burned out. And you'll be surprised or not surprised at all to know that everyone is burned out. <laughs> Pardon me. There are no people in this work who are not experiencing burnout. And burnout is not a week problem, it's not a month problem, it's not a vacation solves it problem. It is a multi-year unfurling of the social fabric and the social emotional fabric that makes it possible for you to do such challenging work. So the number one thing we found out is that everyone's burned out. So if you and I are at odds in this work, uh, we should better, we better believe that not only do might we have a practical difference, a difference in tactics, a strategic difference. We're both experiencing burnout because of the nonstop nature and compounding nature of this work, which changes the conversation about how we heal. Because even if folks in opposition are burned out, in order to do this work in a humane way, we have to respond to that. So every single respondent actually showed that they were very, very burned out or very, very, very burned out which is particularly challenging at this time because there are four generations of folks in this work. And the folks who are the largest number are getting ready to uh, retire en masse, assuming no catastrophic events accelerate that. All the boomers are, are going to walk away uh, by 2030. So 75% of folks who we would call boomers are gonna leave this work by 2030, which given the lack of succession, because of the uh, co internal conflicts means that there's not enough training, supporting and nurturing amongst these groups to get from the gap between baby boomers, millennials and Gen Z, despite the fact that everyone is dealing with it. So the number two thing that we learned is that not only is everyone depleted and distanced and feeling diminished in their capacity to even view what the work might be, that that has a particularly intense response and climate. People who work on HIV AIDS are burned out. People who work in uh, COVID response are burned out. People who work in emergency response are burned out. But climate folks have a very specific window of time right now where if we cannot have a vision of what success looks like, we don't put into motion the things that will make the next version of the future a possibility where folks could come along with a great idea and resolve things. So the burnout in climate and environment is particularly dangerous because we're on a timeline. So uh, recognizing that people are leaving the workplace, folks are ready to retire. Uh, the third thing that we really um, uh, were 
sad and surprised to learn is that not everyone is experiencing burnout in the same way. As I mentioned previously, and as the subject of this conversation, some of us are experiencing climate depression because others of us are racist. <laughs> so, so it's not just that climate is challenging, that we're losing land every day, that we have yet to resolve uh, treaties that have not been supported, uh, communities have not been given equity. We are also recognizing that your identity can make it trouble double or triple or quadruple the amount of pressure that you're feeling and that your colleague can be as dangerous to you as an existential crisis, which means you are doubling down on climate depression. And, and given that this business largely requires you to look like you're winning all the time and yell out uh, so that folks who resource you feel great about what they're investing in, this is a dangerous statistic. For um, this, this particular thing that we learned, I felt as a the founder of Climate Critical Earth, pretty challenged about how to explain it. So despite the rates of burnout that were reported, a majority of the incredible people that we rely on who are invisible in this work will not leave. They have said, because they're worried that if they take rest or a break or sleep or care or take a day off, they could miss the moment where it will really matter. Because they wanna make an impact, they don't walk away. This is really upsetting because those who employ folks in this space, it means, yay, they get to count on continuing having people in the workplace because they're not going anywhere, no matter how terrible it gets. But the reality of that is that burned out folks who cannot envision the future, who are drowning in real life challenges, existential crisis and isolation enhanced by the pandemic are staying in the work and becoming toxic folks who make it more challenging for new people to come in, for new ways to be made, for relationships to be built, because that burn, everyone's so afraid to take their hand off the proverbial wheel. This is challenging because from the employer standpoint, it doesn't represent enough of a threat in how the work happens, because in some cases, these organizations are built on a model where they work you till you burn out. Recently, we did a podcast with The Coolest Show where we talked about lateral violence with uh, Tara Huska. We talked about youth violence with Vic Barrett. We talked about um, le the legacy of burnout with Peggy Shepard from We Act for Environmental Justice. And the thing that she said that was most potent in that conversation was that she was taught that you work until you almost die when you're 35 and someone gives you a desk. So given that the generation before those who are taking the mantle now had no sense that they would be allowed to take a break because of the weight of what they were doing, there's no chance they can demonstrate to the folks coming behind them that that's a healthy response unless we develop a practice. So all of these amazing things we've seen are full of people with big hearts that need to be protected and supported because the people that build our campaigns, that develop our messaging, that work alongside us, and even the ones who disagree with us are so overwhelmed by climate change that it's hard for them to imagine that the individual campaign level organization things they're doing are having an impact, which is more dangerous than the actual truth of what we're facing. So the fifth thing that I'd like to share with you is that there are not enough resources for this work. So the idea that multiple identities can make you multiply uh, vulnerable in a system that automatically uh, turns everything into black and white, homogenizes the issues, uh, is obsessed with fads, the idea that there are not very many resources that are separate from what might be considered professional development if you're in a well-funded organization. It means that any resources you get access to inside your work have to be for more productivity. So uh, one of the things we did was make some calls for um, folks to think through what we're actually asking for so that we are no longer asking people to work until they are no more with not enough people to hold the work. And we cannot imagine that a successful campaign is one where you don't have plans for everyone to take a rest before, during, and after. So we're not asking for anything big, just everything to change. And as I see our, our facilitator uh, coming back, I will uh, pause there and return um, the microphone. Oh, uh, do we, are, we, are we doing on time? No, you're fine. If you wanna just wrap up in the next minute, yes. that'll be great. Yeah, so, so flagging that, the I, one of the things that we found out from folks was that even if their employer suddenly woke up tomorrow and said, here's some resources for burnout, most people would not trust that entity because they've been so harmed and had their vulnerabilities exposed that if they were to receive some support, they would feel like it's a setup. So the thing that's very powerful to learn is that people need a third place to explore these issues, 
to practice rest and to remember why it is they got into this work. And I thank you for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. That was absolutely brilliant and lovely and very much needed. Um, so I want to um, invite all of uh, the panelists back on. If you could turn on your cameras, please. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, what I want to do is approach the moderation in a way that answers the questions that have been posed. Um, and some folks um, pose them in the Q&A, so I invite you to do that because the chat is quite chaotic. Where there's a lot of comments mixed in with questions. So if you have a specific question, please do put it in the Q&A box. Um, and there are a lot of nice comments in the chat box. So if panelists, if you want to take a quick look. Um, so uh, since Tamara just ended, are there a couple of kind of um, clarification questions? Let me start with you. Somebody asked about like, um, who are the people or the groups who are responding to the survey? since we just sort of ended on the survey. So can you just tell us how many people, who they were, um, you know, was this a broader study? Is, was it a finite one that's, you know, one-off, something like that? Just a brief response about the survey itself. Sure, so our goal is to do the survey biannually, just so we could build the base of data. And we're gonna ask the same questions, but for this first year, we thought we need to ask the people who are closest to the work. And the distinction there is that in the US context, we use the word frontline when frankly, the, the front line is like tectonic plates and everyone's on it. Just the question is, what vantage point are you looking at? We talk to folks who are volunteers because they can't find a job to do in this work because they do it on behalf of other things they're doing. We talk to people who are employees and big green organizations. We talk to folks who are employed in very small organizations with one slice of environment. We talk to folks who are in uh, board leadership and governments and organizations. And we talk to funders and uh, I can tell you that a funder that I, that I have grown a lot of respect for said that looking at the report was like staring into the sun because their own burnout was such that trying to grapple with knowing that it's not just their own experience, but it's mirrored across the way the work is happening, made them feel really challenged about how they're showing up in the work and how they would even explain to folks who, might, who they might tee up to resource when they're experiencing it. So not having language to say to their own uh, president that, I am experiencing burnout, so we should definitely fund this. That's a challenge for that individual, and we heard it. So we did a panel recently with someone, um, who, a bunch of people who didn't finish the survey. And the reason we did it was to ask, why didn't you? And they said, I was traumatized by having to think about why I'm so traumatized, which was like a whole, uh, it, was like, it was like pulling up the rug and realizing that uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to make this tool accessible to people who are actively experiencing burnout. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Tamara, for clarifying that. And I think this is really important to have these kinds of surveys just because we get to know these things about what does it mean to do the work, to do engage in this kind of work and what are the repercussions. So you may be from the community that is at a front line. So you're experiencing all of those climate impacts, but then the work itself is then producing other kinds of realities and then that's compounding the issues but it's not known to everybody else so getting this in this kind of data and information um, out there is really really important um, and i want to now turn over to kyle you've got a couple of questions um, one is that you know about teaching indo um, indigenous knowledge systems to non-indigenous students and this is a long debate right it happens internally in the US when people could show up and want to study and it's very extractive it's often called research as theft all right it's often a violation and it happens internationally when you see you know people doing western philosophy you know like charity work or philanthropy and then just showing up and it's often poverty porn and I think this is an important question in terms of those of us who are engaged in increasing understanding and holding space and so that there's more awareness but at the same time navigating that so in terms of knowledge systems because you mentioned that mm -hmm. it is so much about identity and tradition and practice and and place bound communities you know so what is the best or appropriate way to do this so that it generates support for uh, people and movements, and it is not extractive. And this, um, I think, is a great question, even though it's been posed for Kyle, but it applies broadly. You know, whether you're doing it, you know, in parts of Latin America, Asia, or Africa, or whether you're doing it in marginalized spaces within the US or Canada or another settler colonial uh, context. Um, so, I'll, Kyle, do you want to just respond to that from, from the Dakotas? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, there are a few, I think, housekeeping things that we have to consider. The, the first of which I think is the positionality, you know, that was brought up by a, a panelist earlier. 
you know, we have to, number one, um, have, have to have done that work uh, prior to even engaging in such kind of, I think, um, um, querying, uh, honestly, is like, where are you from? Where are your people from? And I'm not talking about like, where do you consider home? Because a lot of people identify as American. Um, but if you identify as American, you are from somewhere else, most likely. And so where is that? What is that land like? How does that, how does the soil feel? You know, and so this is what I teach our students. Many of our students um, are, are indigenous, some are non-indigenous. And so within our indigenous health PhD program and our MPH specialization, this is something that I have to lead with. Um, so positionality, that's the, that's pretty much the first thing we do with our students, um, because not only does it help you understand, like, um, how do I come to this work or how do I come to this space as my whole self and my whole existence, right? And number two, I think once we're able to do that, we, um, we recognize that the, I think the, the, the philosophy of education and pedagogy is very much incompatible with the um, indigenous traditional knowledge systems that I talked about as we've discussed their place-based or place-bound knowledge systems. Whereas if we, um, I think if we look at Western knowledge systems and pedagogies, they're very much set up to dominate, to standardize across one size fits all, right? And so it's gonna take a certain amount of disentangling. And really when, I, when, I, when we talk to our students or even for myself, I think about this as this is the decolonizing approach right now. This is the process. Um, these processes or these, uh, these cannot be standardized, right? Um, you can't say that, um, you know, uh, traditional knowledge systems that have worked in the Southwest, let's say in, in New Mexico, Mexico, um, Arizona, these, these practices, they're not going to work up here in North Dakota and Minnesota. Why is that? Well, the ecosystems are different right? The knowledge systems are different because they're place-based. And so for us, we have to recognize that the standardization is, is not at all. We have to take ourselves out of that and find comfort and solace in that. And finally, I think, again, to our last tenet there that I talked about earlier is we have to recognize Indigenous peoples, uh, their tribal, their communal sovereignty. They have a sovereign right to practice, to teach, and to harness these knowledge systems. Nobody else does, right? And there's many, 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 many indigenous communities. Everybody's indigenous to somewhere, right? And so that's where the positionality key piece comes in. That's where the sovereignty piece comes in. I would say on a very basic level, if you're thinking or contending um, with the idea of doing this, um, find someone who specializes in this that is belongs to the indigenous community from those lands. If it's a, if it's a, a space where people were completely dispossessed of our lands, which is often, you know, in the Carolinas, on the East Coast, Baltimore, it's, you know, um, New York, all these other spaces, you could find someone that's really close that knows that knows someone, you know. So I think just in a nutshell, to to briefly answer that, that would be my suggestion, right? Um, and be an ally, you know. If you're non did in non indigenous, like be an ally, find the people, do that work, right? Because there's someone that knows, there's somebody that knows because these knowledges exist, and I think in order to cultivate them and keep them. Um, strong um that we we have to be um we have to be uh developing opportunities for the people that are the knowledge keepers that are the knowers right and not trying to learn that information and then doing it ourselves as allies uh because then it's i think that's when we're kind of um tiptoeing around appropriation um and and that's inappropriate okay um so yeah, I, I'll, I'll just leave it there or else I'll go on a huge tangent. All right, so um, now I, we've got a couple of questions that have been posed uh, kind of broadly to, to everyone. 
but I, I think this uh, uh, I, I'll just kind of turn it over to each of you if you if you, each of you want to tackle this one. Um, even though it was uh, posed, it could apply maybe to more to what Kyle said or perhaps to Tamara. But how do we think about why is there eco anxiety? Or the question is, is there eco anxiety? Because there's actually research that shows that people don't talk about it as eco anxiety in in many places, especially in, in places across the global south that are experiencing huge amounts of you know onslaughts of you know climate crises and disasters for decades it's expressed through different words in the vernacular it's not necessarily expressed through grief anxiety but through other kinds of material praxis but then also discursive tropes in terms of the words that are used the meanings they hold but so the question was you know in terms of um it, are we seeing at least in the us or where we are um, hearing about it is it an expression because more people are aware of you know um, th their connections you know across uh, let's say um, you know be, uh, the, the connections between the body to the planet what's happening to the planet so is it an anxiety in induced from awareness um, or is that too simplistic way to think about it I don't know let's just take turns who wants to jump in first and we'll just go around quickly Tamara yeah go ahead um so one of the things I can say is I've talked a lot, uh, Britt Ray, who was also here with us, uh, we did an interview on Earth Day that was about um, the luxury of eco-anxiety and the idea that like amongst the things that are, why, it's why I keep connecting this back to the syndemic language we got from HIV AIDS, because that was similarly a suppressed harm coming towards people that created vulnerabilities that were invisible until it was so critical you couldn't do that anymore. And folks who've been thinking about this for 20 years have had this unnamed thing and people who just grow beans and are saying that the beans aren't growing, that the season is changing, that water is not there. And they're deeply um, concerned about the ecological catastrophe, whether or not they've been assigned that kind of language, whether or not they've been told that environment is a luxury item. That means you have to buy a bunch of stuff and be able to look deeply out at the sun with a beautiful photo behind you and a bird on your shoulder. Like there's just so much, there's so much problematic visual, audio, visual language and messaging and code in what we consider environment, that eco-anxiety wouldn't be how people describe it. Um, Mary Anise Heglar, who's one of our advisors, wrote about not being able to read, like as a person who reads and writes for a living and getting emails and being unable to finish doing what she loves to do because she just couldn't process. Um, along with the report are a series of first person accounts that were written by people about how burnout hit them. People that everyone knows, they see all the time, they see them on the news. These people are like, that time when you asked me if I could be on a panel and I never got back to you was because I couldn't answer the question, do you have time? And so what we're trying to do is reframe this idea so that you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have some glamorous, glossy, luxury, eco-anxiety. You could just have existential crisis. Right. Thank you. Because these kinds of surveys, if we expanded across the globe, you'll find similar kinds of responses that or sense of overwhelm. Um, and, and I can speak to that later if we have time, but I'm gonna turn it over to Kaylee. Do you wanna to add to this question about these expressions, uh, you know, for, especially with, with migration and, and displaced, whether it's IDP or, or transboundary? Um, it's interesting, you've already mentioned quite a bit, Farhana, the way in which people conceptualize how they interact with the environment. And I think also Tamara as well, it's, it's a privilege to think about the environment in the abstract like that. Um, often it's part of people's everyday lives. Um, and even when we were um, doing surveys, for instance, as part of my PhD in rural Thailand about, um, you know, in what ways does the environment impact your decision to leave? Uh, that was never the first sort of primary response or primary driver of that migration. Of course, um, economic issues often is a driver, but that's inextric inextricably linked with, with the environment and climate change in many ways. So it's hard to articulate it specifically as eco-anxiety in places, certain places, uh, but certainly um, there is a feeling of being tied to the environment in different ways and the ways in which that is changing and how you can sense that intimately at the tip of your fingers immediately in some cases, rather than having maybe an existential, an ex existential reflection on it. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, it, it's 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 such a fascinating, I, I think, um, issue. The the 
the tendency to feel for the environment and to feel. And I, I want to like when I explain this to people, I um, I, I look at like eco anxiety as kind of a privilege because you're anticipating something that hasn't happened. But when you think about indigenous communities, um, and there's there's been studies on this too. We we've come to understand like ecological grief is a real thing because they've known the land, like they've they've known the land. And that they've seen their land forcibly dispossessed. We have, right? And so, so the ways that they've known the land has is not the same anymore. So it has to change. And so, so what does that feel like when you identify with the land? And so, I, I think about you know grief and loss. Everyone's experienced that. So what does that tell you? You know that you loved something. That you loved somebody. Right. Where whereas anxiety is an anticipatory distress, an anticipatory observation of something that hasn't yet happened. So we might still be comfortable, but we have anxiety, you know, so I, I don't want to minimize anxiety because anxiety is real and it is disabling at some times. But I think of it as how disruptive is eco anxiety to this movement, because in the chat before I kind of made that uh, analogy to learned helplessness. Whereas on the news, we see shock, 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 shock. And then how do we not learn to just lay down and take it because it's impossible? You know, um, and I can share something that was really kind of miraculous for me is once I started looking out towards this idea of planetary health, and recognizing that you know we can still achieve that balance and recognizing like those those important pillars of planetary health that we all have have claim to which is the interconnectedness with their lands as i mentioned before i mean those are opportunities to really um act on you know um so we're not disabled by eco anxiety or climate anxiety but i just wanted to you know because uh, it's very, it, depending on who you are or where you're from, um, what what your community has been through, um, the emotions are are different, you know, there's a, and so just out of respect, I just wanted to add that too. Yeah. Jaquila, how are we doing for time? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I didn't realize my video came on. I think we still have time. We have a half an hour. Okay. Am I right? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Good. Thank you. For, I didn't for realize that. my video came on. <laughs> okay, no problem. I thought Keep you came going. on to tell us. This I is an incredible conversation. It's so close I, to my heart. <laughs> I thought you wanted us to hurry on up, but all right. Okay. Um. So to kind of catch on to that, because there's been other kind of comments and a lot of resources were, were shared. Um. Just to quickly mention the, the source that Kyle shared is one that we've many of us have shared um, on social media in our writing or um, you know with, with our classes and there's been a lot of pushback on that um, there's been various kinds of arguments and debates um, and those of who, who follow me on Twitter have seen the, the arguments I get into with people on, on this in terms of the kind of um, yeah there, there's there's all kinds of takes takes on the kind of whiteness of eco anxiety especially in America uh, from the, speaking internationally from the global south, a lot of people actually see it as, as a luxury, but it's a very suburban luxury where people, you know, feel like they can have the grief, but then they don't do anything with it. So, you know, so a lot of folks from the global south will say, well, fine, feel your anxiety, let it feel you to do something, you know, collective action, support, rest, care economy, you know, kind of some sort of agroecology, do, uh, you know, activism, organizing, fundraising, whatever it is recognizing that can also lead to despair and more burnout, right? So it's cyclical. So it, it is, I mean, for somebody, I'm old, <laughs> not old meaning I'm middle-aged. I mean, I was a youth climate activist, you know, in the first world summit, uh, Earth Summit. Does anyone even know when the Earth Summit was? It was probably before a lot of you were born. So it was in the 1990s. You know, so for, I've been at this my entire life and it is exhausting, but you keep at it. I call it climate rage. So I call it rage and courage because the rage is built into the spelling of courage. And many people have heard me say this in many webinars that, you know, I call it courage. It's courage, <laughs> but it's also rage. So and conjoining and, and I'll, I'll write about it a bit. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'll have a publication out on it if anyone's interested. But I want to turn to this other question that's linked to this, 
That is, can the concern about um, you know how, whether we express it or not internally, externally, or thereafter, um, uh, or in other ways, how can we think about does this or can this fuel the kind of regressive repression, authoritarian, ecofascist regimes that we're seeing? Because um, that that's you know could it fuel that? We're seeing that, for instance, you know some of the white supremacists are tapping into. Um, you know, ecological um, narratives, various kinds, <laughs> very problematic ones, and whether that might lead to, you know, a can this can focus on solastagia end up being fueling um, more of that, or might it not? It could it actually be the opposite? Could it actually counter the rise in ecofascism? I don't know. Do any of you want to um, just take that on? Yes, Tamara. Start by, I can start by saying I'm excited for some fascists to start helping people because you know what happens when you start helping people? You keep helping people. Like, like uh, one of the things that's been very interesting about all of this surveying is recognizing that the instinct to do something is regardless of where you might fit on the spectrum. And once you do it, like I think if, if opposition could pull this off for five minutes and that would resolve it, I would feel much more threatened about this. But what's coming is already here and will not stop, right? So, so the point at which you divest yourself mid-caring, I look forward to seeing anyone try that because the tectonic plates are shifting so that there are no safe places to live. There are no geographies that are safe. There, so, so adding care to people and using that as a mirage, at the end of the day, your enemy is not the boogeyman or boogie woman that you have created. You, when you watch the entire earth disappear underneath your feet, is very challenging to erect as somebody who's responsible for that. And so, so I do think while it is a tangential threat we need to be concerned about, the rhetoric around it that is used for recruiting is really challenging because our language gets absorbed. Like we're offering actual care and repair. We're trying to practice with folks. So it's very disturbing to see it happening. But the, because the work has no end game, like in terms of what we're, what we're losing and how fast we're losing it, I am excited to see the folks who have the capacity to stop caring once they've turned that faucet on. All right, Kyle or Kaylee, do you want to tackle that or does it seem something that you've witnessed? Or yeah, I think this is in response to something I said during the presentation about the weaponization of climate related migration to induce sort of investments in border security um, and border pushbacks. Um, I think we can see this in a couple of ways. One is some environmental leftist movements in particular have embraced sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric um, and sort of this neo-Malthusian rhetoric. Um, we can see this especially in Europe, some left-wing parties being actually anti-immigrant, green parties in particular, uh, in some cases. Um, and we can see it in other places too where right-wing um, politicians start to acknowledge climate change in order to buy into that narrative. Uh, and to double down on sort of these xenophobic um, sort of anti-immigrant narratives. Um, and so we, that's why I sort of made a small plea to be a little bit careful about the nuance and complexities of this and maybe not talk so much about the mass migration of folks um, due to climate change because it does lend itself to those narratives. Um, and I think uh, what's good is we actually, in my past job at Refugees International worked hand in hand with new partnership for new Americans on uh, uh, basically uh, how to talk about this issue, uh, especially for, for journalists or people working in the media, you know, to, to make sure that we place the blame on the correct people that we are able to distinguish uh, a little bit between some of these narratives. Uh, and I would encourage folks to read that if they can. Yeah, I, <clears throat> yeah, I, don't, I don't know how much I have to add, but I, I just think, um, the underlying factor here is like for indigenous communities, we make a lot of parallels between climate change and um, um, colonialism and how that shifted, what it's looking like, you know, it's, it's the same thing, but just repackaged over and over and over. And it kind of reminds me of uh, the pandemic, you know, our, um, this virus changes and it's repackaged to be just as um, invasive, just as uh, effective, uh, but it just learns, you know, and to a certain extent, I think that in order to keep our economy, um, so thinking about capitalism, 
think how to keep this going, there's, there's an active relearning here. So in terms of like eco-fascism, um, turning it into a racist dialogue or pointing the finger at certain peoples, um, I, I, it seems much of the same, you know, and it seems like the same playbook just reappearing. Um, and so I, I, that's kind of all I have to really add to that. And it's just, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to reconcile because as we've pointed out before, um, different communities are, are, you know, shouldering the responsibility because they see the vulnerabilities in their communities as being higher, whether that's marginalized, oppressed, disenfranchised groups. And um, we have communities, whether that's organizations, large, um, large organizations or institutions that take every opportunity through greenwashing and other methods to be able to um, keep a foot in the door, you know, and I just read something today that the, um, I, I want to say uh, COP28, the person leading it's actually an oil industry executive. Like this seems like the, you know, and not too different from COP26. I remember we were having these conversations because uh, there was more oil uh, extractive industry people there than there were actually from um, the indigenous per, uh, person's caucus. But um, anyway, you know, that's kind of, that's what came to my mind is just the many faces that, um, that this work and um, is, is going to see as, uh, as an opposition moving forward. And but we've seen the playbook before. That's very true. Thank you, Kyle. Um, and making that connection that it is about systems, right? So we often think about communities because that's where we're feeling it. We're talking about individuals, we're talking about communities, but it is that communities form parts of systems and it is the systems that need to be dismantled, um, but that doesn't absolve us of individual you know, agency, but, and, and, but then there's also structures at play. And, and I think this is so important why I keep raising collective action because when we focus on grief and anxiety, it's individualized and personalized. And we lose the connections of building community. And so what you know, Tamara and others are talking about, and Kelly was warning us to be cautious with our words because we can do care and repair, but for whom? And who does it exclude in the process, yeah? So I, I think this is a great opportunity to also thinking about transnational alliance building. So what does it mean for indigenous folks in the US while being respectful and honorable and dedicated to their communal work, which is exhausting? But to find, you know, that kind of leapfrogging strategy, what's happening with indigenous communities in, I don't know, Nepal, right? Are there similarities? Are there different kinds of support or funding that can be tapping into other cross alliances? You know, similarly with, you know, what's happening with um, a black activists who are organizing for Black Lives Matter and then finding alliances with AIDS activists from the prior generation, you know, what are the similarities? So there's lots of kinds of ways to learn across that or what's happening with AIDS activists in South Africa who've been battling this the longest. Uh, so I think those kinds of transnational alliances are what we're often missing. And uh, that kind of solidarity building, again, is a different kind of work. But it also means we have to step outside ourselves. And, and I, I've become notorious for saying that we need to think of our connections instead of just us. That, you know, yes, feel our grief and anxiety and rage and what does it do next? You know, it's, it's just feeling is, is not, is insufficient. It's fine, feel, then what do you do with it? And I think many, many folks uh, throughout these a few days are mentioning that. And because I'm coming at it from an international Global South perspective, I don't see as much alliances and there is that kind of grievance of US imperialism, of US corporations and globalization and, you know, and the local elite forming those kinds of patronages and then people at the bottom really falling behind. So there's all kinds of structures that play at different scales and different levels. So we need to figure out how do we dismantle those because that's what decolonizing means to me. Um, it is not, it is about homeland, but once you have homeland, you can still have colonizers around you, right, through international institutions and global policy, you know, policy making economists who tell you what you need to do with your country and your community and budgeting and finance and corporate, you know, uh, uh, control and corporate shills too, um, so be mindful of that. So I want to turn um, to the next question, um, because I think it's also important, and it was um, basically asking folks about this question 
from uh, Bio um, Como Lafe, and he said, quote, what if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis, end quote. So what if the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis? So what if we're doing is actually just compounding or reaffirming the, the, the structures and systems and the crisis we're in? Uh, yes, um, Tamara, did you want to jump in? I thought I saw your hand first. Yeah, well, when I was affirming the question as the answer to the question, uh, but also, yeah, I mean, I think it, this is what makes it a dynamic conversation is that there are no, this this one point that we made about how even the person you're fighting with is also burned out. Like there's a real question about basic humanity that has to come into play because if you are fighting with someone who is at that level, that low level of their own capacity, the kinds of fighting gets dirtier and dirtier in the same way that we worry about heat creating more conflict. We are, let's just assume we're all overheated. And so the idea that that this that our responses when we are burned out are the most short-sighted version of the thing. So even if on a day where things were going well, I could come up with the answer to the question. If I am on my last nerve, as my grandmother would say, the answer you're going to get is either how, what it is, it's all just less. And so given the, the scope of solutions that we need coming from community, it's why community is our answer to the question because it is the smartest, biggest uh, organism for resolving conflict that removes it from the fallacy of like interpersonal and personal capacity. So I, 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 feel like, I feel like, yeah, how we respond to it is definitely a good percentage of what we've done wrong. And in, in climate in the US, I often say that we could solve climate change in five minutes if we stop fighting about all the other things we we're fighting about before we get to that. All right, Kaylee, Kyle. Really hard to follow up on that, um, <laughs> but but what I should say, um, yeah, I think I was alluding to this earlier, right? If we're we're solely sort of tunnel vision focused on climate change as this thing that we have to tackle and that will end all of our problems or solve all of our problems, then we've missed the big picture, and that's what you were alluding to earlier as well, Farhana, right? There, there's bigger isms that we need to get at in order to actually address or even start addressing the climate crisis. Um, so it, it's the, important to keep that in mind. So if we, we're just sort of singularly tunnel visioned, we, we won't be getting there uh, in a way that's impactful. Sure. Thank you, Kyle. I agree. I mean, I, I think there's just so many intersecting crises that ultimately lead to, you know, the, the climate crisis, climate change. And one thing that, that um, you know, I think what Tamara had alluded to and um, what came to mind for me was as an Ojibwe person, we, we have this um, creation story about how uh, Turtle Island was created. And it's, it's very kind of, a, a lot of our traditional and creation stories are very mythic-like, and this one is not indifferent, not different, but um, the way it goes is that there is this, um, <clears throat> um, this star woman that came down and um, came down to earth, and she, um, she was resting on a turtle's back and everything around them was water. And what they realized was that they had to get some dirt um, from the from the from the lake bed or from the you know from from the bed of that body of water, and so all of these animals joined them, and the deepest divers, you know, and finally it was a muskrat that actually died on the way up. For, uh, but they opened his hand and and it and they had a piece of dirt. Um, that they put on the turtle's back and it eventually grew into um, North America. And so to me, I think that's a, a really good metaphor or analogy for what it might take for us to come together and reconcile all of these intersecting issues, you know, and that's catastrophic, you know, and I think there's a lot of testimony to that in a lot of our, certainly our indigenous communities, right? Um, and it's unfortunate and it's sad, but at what scale, you know, and I think about an addict, um, an addict, they say, has to reach rock bottom, you know, in order to change. And so if we take that as kind of a macroscopic view of an addiction, whether that's white supremacy, racism, um, 
capitalist views, whatever it is, ownership of, of real estate, all of these things that separate the haves and the have nots. Um, I don't know what that, that that's going to be because it hasn't happened yet, you know, and that's the sad part is people are comfortable, you know, and yet we're, we're trying to uh, reconcile or understand how do we make the uncomfortable, the communities that are engaging on the front lines of this climate crisis, migrants, indigenous peoples, uh, black communities, um, those with disabilities, elders, children, you know, um, how to help them. But I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. And that's a pessimistic, very cynical view, but it's hard not to be honestly. Maybe that's just my burnout too. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. I, well, you wouldn't be wrong there, Kyle, because it, it is burnout, but I think it's also the fact that we don't have all the answers. If we did, we'd solve the problems, right? All we're doing is trying to recognize that doing this work is hard, but it is necessary. And that some folks, some of us have been doing it um, for decades uh, and you, you keep at it at the best you can. You do what you can with what you have from where you are at that point, and then you do better the next time, right? Um, so it's, it's a journey and it's, it's never an end point. And, and I think one of the things about um, in looking at intersectionality, and, and this was uh, one of the questions that came up in terms of well, what do we do about, you know, uh, disabled folks. And, um, you know, disabled folks are often excluded globally, but it depends on what, what axis of disability are you looking at, right? Is it physical disability? Is it, you know, mental? Is it a combination? But at the same time, recognizing that in many communities don't have any form of support uh, for uh, variously dis disabled, marginalized, or variously differently abled, however you want to use the term. But at the same time, um, those are often the places that don't have the support of the people are just getting up and getting on with it. They, they just, they don't have a choice. They just do because they have to survive. And, you know, so it is an interesting um, thing that I, I've witnessed that in a, a, you know, as a member of a of disabled community that you do the best you can, but you also recognize that there's different ways that you have to learn to adapt and that means that you are already doing stuff but you do have expectations of the more generously abled spaces and places and peoples will create conditions for your survival uh, that is not always the case and and so if we extend that kind of you know if we say universal design is the way to be universally equitable then perhaps we can think about what are the ways we can think about creating climate justice approaches and policies and programs and funding um, and support networks and care economies that include um, all sorts of people, all sorts of identities. And I think that this is one of the erasures that we need to overcome. And it goes back to what Tamara was saying, that if we all stop fighting, which I'm going to rephrase and say, if we all stop noticing just the differences, but noticing the similarities and that we need to create conditions that are inclusive of all different groups um, to the best that we can. And that is incredibly hard because the forces against that creation are incredibly strong. So if it is not in the interest of neoliberal capitalism to create conditions of survival and thriving and, you know, kind of generous or generative well-being, it is going to figure out ways to exploit whatever is being put forth. And, um, and there's a lot of greenwashing going on. I mean, look at all the, you know, the tech bros running off to utopian geoengineering and this, that, and the other, and carbon capture and CDR and DAC and what have you. What about reducing burning a fossil fuel, figuring out that instead of trying to figure out how do you capture a few molecules where the rest just fall like, you know, sand through your fingers. You know, so these are the conversations that are harder to have, at least in the US, because they've been so captured by wider forces. So I think this is something that um, all of uh, many, many people have mentioned that it is about tackling the systemic underlying injustices. <laughs> that is also really hard. And, and if you need to channel your eco anxiety, eco grief as anger towards those systems that are compounding your grief and anxiety and concern then that's the where that's where your action should lie right no one can be prescriptive but figure out what floats your boat and then channel it that way 
<laughs> anyway, um, how about um, Kaylee, Tamara, Kyle, do you want to add anything further? Because I think we've kind of touched on those points and we are running close to time. But I just wanted to give you guys the last opportunity, you know, to reflect or say anything else. I don't think so. I, we did see. Yeah, exactly. I was like, we could let that just be the punchline and, you know, be over. I, I do want to kind of echo what um, someone said in the chat, though, because uh, many disabled folks want to be part of the solution. Um, we don't want to just be accommodated, you know, and so I think how do we make people work in these spaces, make them more accessible, but, you know, give um allow everybody to participate and i think that we need everybody i can certainly say that and i think in terms of like a lot of um as the question kind of talked about earlier was that we need all the allies we need everybody in this movement you know because that's what it's going to take so thank you kyle camera kelly a big, I'm a big fan of uh, um, of leading by example. It's all been said, so I'm I'm excited to continue to have this conversation as we're doing our work every day. It's been really powerful just to just to start to touch the surface of how much synergy there is. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara Kelly. I'm ready to climb a rage with you, Farhana. Let's you know leave this on a positive note. We're connecting and we're moving forward together. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our um, panelists today, um, Kyle, Kaylee, and Tamara, and to everyone who joined us, you know, hundreds of people, but also want to end on a positive note that when we think about, well, I use the word rage, but I also use the word revolution. And the word we can say careful, meaning full of care, not just cautious as in careful, but careful revolutions come from whatever you need to channel into it and build those alliances. So we've learned a lot amongst each other today. And I think it's really, really imperative that we move forward, whether it's through political voting, which matters, local elections matter in the US, right? So the, the vote matters, funding matters, holding people accountable matters, you know, all of these things. So we all need to get involved and not just feel. We feel and we do. I mean, I say that to my students every semester. <laughs> I'll probably put that on my tombstone. <laughs> so thank you all. And, um, you know, please do keep doing and being and sensing. Thank you. Thank you, Dekila, for organizing this. Thank you so, so much, all four of you. This was just incredible, incredibly energizing, so thought provoking heart opening oh my gosh i'm so ready to go rage with all, all of you and now i actually have to lead a meditation okay <laughs> pray for I all of us 